Our next talk is from Kate Kendall, a wonderful, wonderful presenter who's been all over the world. She's been in San Francisco, she's been in Melbourne. Um, she's here via Melbourne, via San Francisco for the, for the conference today. And we're very excited to have her present. Uh, her talk is titled Goodbye Silicon Valley, The Rise of the Indie Way. <laughs> Cool. So I'm Kate and I'm a bit of a wildcard presenter. Um, that's where, as I was kind of coming back to Australia, um, was really thinking about um, my kind of time in Silicon Valley and how it's kind of changed. And I was like, well, this is a really good time to talk about the rise of indie companies. And um, so to begin, um, so yeah, my background, um, I founded a company called Cloud Peeps, which is a little bit like an upmarket Upwork, so it's a freelance marketplace. Um, also had a company before that was um, where I crowdfunded, um, and then also co-founded the Aussie um, Founders Network in Silicon Valley. So I kind of had a bit of a range of different experiences. And um, with this talk, I kind of really wanted to um, take a little bit of my own story. Like usually I do presentations and it's all like data driven and it will be quite full on, but really I wanted to tell my story because it kind of sets up why I believe, um, you know, goodbye Silicon Valley and why I'm really interested in more of this indie pathway. So um, I was kind of active in the early days of Melbourne tech scene and um, I chose this photo because I felt like it described Melbourne, but right now I feel like it's describing Sydney as well. Um, <laughs> so. Um, so I started like one of the earliest tech meetups there and um, there was like a little bit of a, a community going. Um, it was a little bit um, kind of primitive in a way, like I went to a Hacker News meetup and I got asked why I was there because, you know, women who go to meetups, they're like, you're only there if you're a partner or something. So it was kind of really um, old school and I wasn't really finding my tribe. Um, there was a developer community, but not really like a startup community as such. So in 2010, I did the whole like cheesy Silicon Valley trip and really kind of um, like got uh, dived into the industry and met people like Marissa Mayer and Paul Graham and went um, joined a like YC company and just kind of um, really kind of fell in love with that early um, founder community and the people that were creating and making stuff there. And so I kind of walked away of that three months trip going, you know, I really want to build something great and I want to find that tribe. So, you know, coming from Australia, the early community wasn't much there. It's changed nowadays, but I kind of felt like I had to go to San Francisco. And so from there, I ended up like being basically like a digital nomad, <laughs> which the term itself is a bit, you know, um, but yeah, so I was like based in Berlin for a bit. I went to Bali, um, was in New York for two years and then really the Bay Area for about five years. Um, and then it was really that like I uh, started Cloud Peeps in about 2014 and that's what kind of brought me back um, to San Francisco. And that's where I kind of want to talk a little bit about this growth at all costs model. So... Um, yeah, I didn't raise uh, funding for my first company, but then with my second company, it really kind of was drilled in that, like, are you really a legitimate entrepreneur if you haven't raised money? And, you know, every day you're kind of going on TechCrunch, you're seeing these massive rounds of funding that have been announced. Um, you know, as you're kind of talking about what you're doing, people are like, oh, how much money have you raised? What have you done? Like, so I kind of felt like it was almost part of that indoctrination into the culture that you must raise money. And, you know, it's like you want to prove yourself and you, you want to prove that, yeah, you have a, you know, a company. So I ended up raising a million dollars from top tier, like Silicon Valley investors, some in New York and some in Australia as well. And, uh, you know, I raised at first on a five mil valuation, then an eight mil valuation. And even then, that's not really extreme for like an angel round. Uh, at that time of like 2014, lots of people were raising money on like uncapped convertible notes. So it's really like this whole game. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all about being like the hottest startup in the valley. And then for a while, it was kind of like that. Like it was hustling all the time. I was on like This Week in Startups, meeting Aussie politicians who go to San Francisco um, and it's just this whole kind of, you know, hustle at all costs type community. 
Um, and then there's the obsession with the minimum of 20% month-on-month growth. So that is even like the minimum rate. Like unless you're scaling at like 50% month-on-month, it's like you're not good enough and, you know, you're not going to be attractive to future investments. So this really, really got tiring as um, I started scaling the company because it just wasn't going to be sustainable. So at that same time, there was really like the rise of the on-demand economy. So this is when like Uber and Lyft were just exploding. You know, you could get a ride around um, San Francisco for four or five dollars. Sometimes it was just even free if you got credits. So everyone was um, cloning like the on-demand um, companies. They were trying to be the Uber for X. So it was like the peak, um, peak on-demand point in time. And then also, I remember that one time we just got donuts delivered um, to our door. I think it was through Postmates, but there wasn't any purchase. There wasn't any think why. They just delivered donuts. They hadn't an, um, an offer going. And so this was kind of like the, the peak of kind of Silicon Valley. And you could get, you know, laundry on demand, massages on demand. Uber was even doing puppies on demand. So it was quite a good tactic because people were posting about it. But... Um, you know, I just feel, and then there's even Hello Alfred, where you can have a butler that comes to your house and um, basically is your butler on demand. Um, so I, I felt like I was getting really lo- uh, lazy as well, like, because with Amazon, you could just order anything to your door, and often it was even, like, sometimes same day. I remember looking outside my window, and there was a Walgreens across the street going, oh, should I go buy some toothpaste, or would it be faster just getting it off Amazon? <laughs> and And that's, like, how... You know, just I, I think it's bad for the planet. Like, I, you just become lazy. And then it got me thinking about this um, quote, which was really about like San Francisco was turning into basically outsourcing your mother. <laughs> so, um, and so I was like, what am I kind of doing here? I wanted to move here and work on um, like really good problems. So, I kind of just found like, what are, you know, why am I here? What's happening? And then also coming from like working in New York for a couple of years and then going to San Francisco, I kind of felt like it was becoming the new Wall Street and I didn't really want to get into tech to kind of uh, just be about the money. And it just seemed like that was the majority of um, like investors were basically leading that conversation in the community. And then this is where like it started to switch. So It was kind of peak, almost second bubble in like 2013, 2014. And on the left here, you can see Paul Graham talking about one of the fastest growing startups of Y Combinator of all time called Homejoy, um, which was an on-demand cleaning startup. And then on the right, you can see that it it shut down and they'd raised, you know, close to 66 million in funding. And this wasn't like a, um, you know, loan story this was happening all around me and really like the unit economics of the whole thing um, just weren't making sense anymore and people were just losing money and then that also was coupled with the series a crunch um, and the ipo slowdown so you know it was relatively easy to raise a seed or angel round in silicon valley in the past few years Um, However, as the kind of more and more companies raised seed, um, it was harder to kind of get to Series A. um, And people weren't just hitting those milestones that were required for Series A. Um, So people were just not having enough um, kind of, they just weren't hitting those milestones. And then at the later stage, um, a lot of companies, these, you know, so-called unicorns, weren't IPOing. So that meant that a lot of like investor capital just were, wasn't being returned to funds and things were starting to change. Then um, at the same time, there was a complete kind of disregard for regulation. And, you know, this is kind of like asking for forgiveness rather than permission. And I think there's a fine line um, where you want to kind of, you know, honour the law um, versus getting stuff done or being that cowboy and Zenefits was an example of they were writing um, scripts to get around mandatory um, certification for healthcare benefits marketplace in the US. So um, they were, you know, trying to kind of operate so fast that they were like, let's game this whole system. And they got found out and the CEO uh, got fired. 
And of course, like the Theranos story is well known and I encourage people to read the book Bad Blood. But again, th these are kind of things that do you really wanna um, kind of not, not follow these regulations um, about. And then if anyone's from uh, Australia and saw what happened with bike sharing, how so many bikes were just dumped around like Melbourne, Sydney, they were in like the Yarra River, they were just all over. And um, this is kind of, this is a photo of just bike share oversupply from China. And again, it's this like, what's the cost of this? Is it actually solving a problem? Do we want this? And then, oh, so when I was in San Francisco in 2014, there was an incident where as more and more what I call tech bros were coming to the city, um, there was this culture clash of people who had been in the city for ages and there was this kind of um, infamous incident where um, people from Airbnb and Dropbox were going to play soccer and they kicked off the, the local Latino kids from the pitch and they uh, were kind of saying like, we've booked this and then the kids were like, but we've been playing here for decades. And so it kind of just became like, the mission's becoming really gentrified and um, it's not really kind of honouring um, the local residents. Um, and there was another story which was around tech buses. So the shuttle buses shuffle people from, you know, um, Facebook and Google and companies down in the South Bay to San Francisco. And there was really this culture clash again between tech and then local residents and um, there's a book around throwing rocks at the Google book um, bus which talks about this again in more details but again it was this whole change and if anyone um, which I'm sure a lot of people have um, gone but if you have gone to San Francisco you will notice like there's huge income inequality and homelessness and um, you know you can see people pull up in the latest Tesla right next to someone on the street and it's just it's just kind of mind-blowing how um, different it is. Okay, so, and like a huge shift, um, which is why people I think it's more than ever like interested in this um, kind of changing of the guard with San Francisco, is that it's now the most expensive place to rent on earth. And speaking in Sydney, I mean, Sydney siders probably would laugh at that because it's expensive here too, but it has, it's overtaken, you know, New York, Hong Kong, um, and this was the recent cost of living index that came out by numbeo.com. So this is uh, described as this photo is actually a one bedroom apartment, but basically it's closet that's been converted into a bedroom. So, and at the same time, people were being priced out. So there's teachers, nurses, they're like now commuting two hours each way to service schools and hospitals. So it's just becoming very um, unsustainable to kind of live there. And personally, I was paying a thousand Australian dollars a week for a one bedroom apartment, which isn't obscene. So the other thing about my journey was, um, as I was doing investor relations, I really found um, that it was kind of this pathway which, where I literally got told by investors not to have kids. Um, someone told me that I should sex myself up on Instagram, like to get more, um, interest, like just the weirdest stuff you can um, think of. Uh, someone said they wanted to get t-shirts printed that said exits before babies. Um, and so I was like, what is this like world? This isn't um, normal. And uh, it really kind of turned me off. So I then was thinking, well, like the free donuts aren't really free, right? Because VCs are bankrolling the whole thing and it's not necessarily, um, you know, sustainable. And recently, um, with Social Capital, who were the darlings of the kind of seed to Series A um, scene, they've now changed their whole fund and uh, they're thinking that the growth-focused startup scene is an enormous multivariate kind of Ponzi scheme. So that's someone who was like the, you know, one of the number one kind of um, leaders in the communities now saying like this, this whole uh, thing of how funds work aren't just going to work and it's going to run out of juice. So, to summarise um, expectations and reality, I guess I was thinking, you know, start my own company, be your own boss. The reality is if you take investment, they're your bosses. 
Uh, you know, I love solving problems that I've experienced, but really those problems have to agree um, if investors experience them too. You know, you think that you might have financial freedom when you go and join a startup or start something, but really you might be sacrificing your earning potential um, and even your, you know, financial uh, sustainability as well. Um, you know, work however you want. One of the things, I'm a huge lover of remote work. Um, and as I started to, you know, chat with investors, often they'd want you to come into their offices. They might have a co-working space associated with that and want you to work there too so they can basically watch what you're doing. <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to, like, build things with love, but, you know, the whole motto, which Facebook has admittedly now changed, but the move fast and break things culture... Um, operating lawfully, again, back to that zenith thing versus doing, doing whatever it takes to win. Um, having a life, having a family, um, work is your life. Um, the thing that I think is important is really thinking about long term, but there I think everyone is really about the short term. What can you do in the here and now? And again, when you're looking for inspiration, often what ends up happening is you're just talking to everyone around you and then your problems kind of turn into the same problems and you end up solving these problems that aren't really world problems. Um, and then the other one's a bit, um, you know, jokey, but there are hot tubs, like literally people buy hot tubs with investor money and put them in their offices. Um, <laughs> so, or they'll like get stretch hummers and go on like... Um, client relation trips and stuff like it's just all kind of very excessive and over the top so um, that just kind of led me to think well this is a bit of a hamster wheel life I don't think I'm making a difference or really getting ahead and I kind of said no thanks and then through that kind of journey I started thinking about well like what about the indie way and I'll talk a little bit how it's different from bootstrapping and um you know, self-funding and things like that. But it reminds me of this quote, like, why join the Navy if you can be a pirate? And um, I think the Silicon Valley was slowly kind of turned into the Navy. And from there, really the, like, godfathers of the anti-Silicon Valley way are obviously base camp. They've got, um, you know, a book coming out, which is like, it doesn't have to be crazy at work. Um, so they've been talking about this for a long period of time. And they've had, like, a lasting legacy as well with, like, you know, obviously creating Ruby. So I think that they're, like, must kind of, I must, like, honour them in this um, journey. And so you've had this kind of um, switch, you know, with music, with gaming, with publishing, and now I really want it to happen more with companies. Um, so what exactly is an indie company. So from here, um, Indie VC, which is um, like a seed fund for uh, indie businesses, um, they have come out and just said, look, real businesses make products and sell them for a profit. They focus on customers, revenue and profitability, not investors, valuations and the next fundable milestone. And they prioritise their customers' needs over eyeballs and they have a functional business model, not a believable financial model. And they want to stay in business, not run for the exit. And they create their own source of funding. And they don't have to ask anyone's permission to exist. And so they've kind of come out and really, um, like, have led a lot of the movement as well. So now I'm going to, like, walk through eight things which I think um, divide the kind of growth-focused VC back startups versus indie. So... The first one is like focus on profitability versus growth, which sounds very uh, kind of obvious, I think, for, for business, but surprisingly it's not. Um, there's a lot of like vanity metrics that go thrown around when you're raising capital. And um, for me, even with Cloud Peeps, like um, one of it was adding as many freelancers as possible to the platform, which actually is a completely meaningless way to go about it. Uh, adding more freelancers doesn't make... Um, really different to our sustainability at the end of the day. So that was kind of an example of chasing growth versus chasing profitability. Okay. And then focusing on sustainability versus fast exits. So um, building a 10-year-plus company, people have started to talk about, you know, staying for the long term and really building a company that survives. It's a bit like the Patagonia approach, but... Um, 
even if you think of startups like Slack, right, you think it's kind of an overnight success, but it was founded in 2009, so it's nearly a decade old. So these things take time, they take a lot of kind of work, and so I think this kind of cult of you're going to have something and then have a flip and, um, you know, make bank and move on is just kind of like a massive myth. Um, and the founder of WhatsApp, who sold um, it to Facebook, right, 19 billion, he backed um, Signal, with, which is a Facebook uh, WhatsApp alternative, obviously it's more secure, with 50 million, and he turned it into a 501c nonprofit. So, and wished he'd never sold to Facebook. So, it's great that you can make a lot of money personally, um, but what's the real thing now? Like, you know, the integrity of WhatsApp, integrity, a lot of things. Um, what would you rather have longer term? And a lot of founders are realizing that they would have much rather um, had their products than that exit. And same with Instagram. So the other thing is a focus on lean teams versus headcount. So, um, you know, the startup tracking tool Mattermark, it's um, been acquired now, but it used to kind of focus on showing growth to VCs. And one of the data points was um, were how many people you had hired on LinkedIn. And so that was kind of this success metric by headcount. And I remember that with CloudPeeps, because we had um, a lot of freelancers, they often would list themselves on LinkedIn. They weren't kind of employees. We were a very lean team, but um, we were like trending on there because of this kind of vanity metric of like pseudo headcount. And it just kind of showed how a lot of it is just kind of bullshit metrics. Um, Craigslist is a fantastic example of revenue per employee. So they make 1.8 million um, in revenue per employee each year. And that's the, you know, larger than say Google um, or Facebook. So I kind of feel like this return to a revenue per employee could be an exciting metric to track. And I'd love more like transparency around that. Okay. So the other thing is a focus on controlled capital versus valuations. So this is where it's not necessarily like the bootstrapper approach, which is, um, you know, you may never raise capital. That might not be the intention. Um, you can still raise capital, but you just wouldn't dilute your ownership too much out of the, the company or become a minority um, shareholder so you didn't have decision-making power um, or give away board seats to investors because that's what they're asking for. And one of the things that IndieVC does is that it offers an investment document where if you don't uh, have an exit, you can actually return the capital to them in the form of dividends on revenue. So I think as... Um, like legal instruments change to match with the rise of indie companies, there'll still be capital that um, comes in, but it won't all be geared towards that exit or that follow-on uh, round of funding. Okay, and the other thing is um, being focused on customer value versus press. So um, often, you know, uh, startups um, in Silicon Valley, it's all about the tech crunch um, spike that you get. It's all about letting having that um, being kind of, you know, talked about and everything like that. And really, at the end of the day, that can make no difference at all to your actual company. So just a return to talking to customers, focusing on their problems, creating value for them um, versus just your own kind of story. And interestingly, um, part of the indie movement is that it allows for, I guess, inclusivity. So you don't have to be a Zuckerberg clone to get funding, as um, I think Paul Graham famously said. And, you know, Peter Thiel, who really likes young founders and has the, the blood startup that takes their blood and he injects it to get that youthful glow. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not all about that. And um, recent, like, um, data came out from the US Census Bureau and MIT that said a person who is 40 years 2.1 times as likely to found a successful startup as a person who is 25. Um, so I think this is really exciting that it's a get about the product. It doesn't have to be about what the founder looks like or where they're from or where they went to college, which is a huge obsession in Silicon Valley as well. So one of the kind of exciting things to emerge is profit sharing versus stock options. So when you're working for a San Francisco or a Silicon Valley company, you often get promised stock options and people are kind of, I guess, falsely um, employees think that they're going to um, get rich from stock options. And 
Really, if you want to get rich as an employee in um, Go uh, Silicon Valley, you'd probably go work at Google. It's very unlikely that your stock options you get at most startups will ever convert into anything. And I had a friend who, um, she was working in Australia for a US company, and the company's um, stock ended up um, not increasing at the same rate it needed to, and she had a greater tax liability than the stock was even worse. So she basically lost money by taking um, stock options from a US company. So um, that's why I think profit sharing is um, a way to kind of entice employees in um, a greater capacity. And ConvertKit, who are really um, you know, champions of the indie way, they've got it now that their bonus is awarded, um, that 25% is based on the time period of time with a company, and 75% is based on performance on a zero to four scale. So if you're thinking about profit sharing over stock options, check out their post. Um, also seeing this a lot with blockchain, where um, companies that are founded on the uh, blockchain, they're now giving revenue to not only um, contributors, team members, but also users. And I think that's um, shaking things up. And then finally, um, that there's a huge kind of shift from uh, glo local. So being based in um, the US, being investors, you know, being obsessed with the talent only exists in Silicon Valley, to now being global. Um, and having that whole remote work. And I think that I started to see a lot of um, investors on Twitter tweeting about remote work, like it's this brand new thing. Um, especially in the last like month, it's gone viral there. It's a new trend. Um, so I think it's, uh, they're kind of now realizing, okay, talent is everywhere. It's too expensive to be based here anymore. If you're hiring someone, you've got to compete with like 500K um, salary offers. Um, so it's just it's just now like a lot of people are hiring remote teams and going distributed. And with this, it just shows that, hey, there are a lot of companies being um, created out of China um, now, and it's not just all that that uh, kind of value is being created out of the US. Okay, so in summary, um, an indie company, you know, focuses on profitability, they focus on sustainability, they focus on lean teams, controlled capital, um, inclusivity, profit sharing, and really like a global approach. And uh, the thing is, if you've already gone down that pathway, is it ever too late to change? And I'm just gonna kind of walk through a couple of um, case studies of how people did change. And to start off with, I just wanted to talk about a tale of two Aussie startups. So. Atlassian started here in Sydney. It was bootstrapped for the first eight years and then um, went on, obviously, to IPO and raised $210 million. And Shoes of Prey um, were kind of the, what I call, like, the Silicon Valley approach where, you know, they raised a lot of capital, close to $26 million, and unfortunately recently closed doors after struggling to kind of get the right unit economics and business model and everything like that. And that's just an unfortunate kind of reality um, of startups, of course, but I do think like figuring stuff out, taking little capital to begin with, growing slowly in the first few years, and then when you've really kind of got things um, sorted, then kind of putting more fire on it um, to scale. So the other thing that came up recently were investor buyouts. So companies that have taken a lot of capital um, how do they kind of change that once they've got investors? And definitely recommend checking out Buffer and Wistia's approach to this. So Buffer raised a Series A of um, 3.9 million, and then they've slowly been buying investors back. Um, and then they've managed to buy out two thirds of the Series A investors. Um, and they still ended up with a 40% return. And uh, Indie VC kind of say like, that's not really impressive to traditional venture investors, but if you've got an alternative seed fund of 40% returns, still really good. And Wistia, um, to buy out their investors, they've taken on 17 million in debt, um, but they're now kind of committed to this long-term pathway. And then I've just put some other examples here of indie companies, um, things like Zoho, which is a huge competitor to Salesforce, CRM, MailChimp, based out of Atlanta, they're always spoken about quite a lot. Um, 
nomad list, Peter Levels is um, worth a follow on Twitter. He also talks a lot about the indie way. And there's just some really great companies that are kind of coming out there now and um, talking about how they're doing things differently. And indie hackers, of course, should be mentioned because they're kind of like the new Hacker News, but for indie gear companies. And a lot of the kind of interviews feature revenue, metrics, everything like that. So um, if you actually want to kind of scale from a one person company to um, a you know, scalable product, that's worth um, checking out for interviews. Okay. So what's next, I guess? Like, how can we better serve indie companies and um, how can indie companies grow more? So one of the things are the rise of like non-equity-based accelerators. Um, and I, was, I went through one in Queensland called Hot Desk um, at the end, about a year ago now. It's a six-month program where they give you 100K to go be based in Queensland and build your company there. <laughs> so um, that was the cohort. Um, there's some really interesting companies that have gone through there. It's modeled a little bit on Startup Chile. Um, that are in the kind of little photo down the bottom, I've got equity free accelerators. So now there's this whole kind of yeah, rise of where maybe governments partnering with local industry to attract talent there. Um, but again, you're not diluting your company. And Tiny Seed got announced this week, it's gonna be a startup accelerator designed for bootstrappers. Then you also have equity crowdfunding um, where that's, you know, Australian regulations have just changed, but companies like Republic, which um, coincidentally AngelList have, um, I think, invested in or actually own, um, you can make investments in a lot of companies now. Um, I've invested in a few um, different companies from there, and I there's a trend of micro-investing, but I kind of call it nano-investing because you can invest, you know, 100 bucks into a company now. Um, even sometimes, like, investing in competitors because then you only get all their, um, like investor reports and things like that. So it's it's kind of worth it. Um, so yeah, check out Republic and there's a couple that are in Australia now, but I think that will change as well in getting community to basically your users to fund your company. And obviously business models need to change. I think that we're seeing a lot of, you know, the problems with media and social networks is that, you know, is it ever really free? And the advertising backed model is kind of causing friction, right, with what people want. So I think just a return to just getting paid for what you create or what you make is happening. And there's companies like Podia, lots of membership subscription sites that are launching where online like founders, creators, makers are now just charging for whatever they, they're doing. And that's kind of like the early days of the web um, community, but I think we're returning there now um, too. So then you've also got like change in um, communities, education. One of the things that I posted about recently was that like a lot of the events for startups, um, they're just all focused on like the founder's journey or how to raise money or how to get up on stage and pitch, which is kind of funny anyway, because most of the time when you're raising money in Silicon Valley, it's over coffee. So you, you often don't raise any money by going and speaking to an audience. Um, and so it's really about returning again to like creating events that are actually about product. Um, I kind of miss that in the startup community. Not really anyone talks about product much anymore. And so I've got that there. Um, yeah, so a greater focus on product over pitching. And so all of this kind of got me thinking of, um, well, you know, I really want to build a legacy. I don't just want to be thirsty. And I think a lot of time in uh, yeah, the startup land, it's all about being kind of, um, you know, just being thirsty rather than building a legacy. So I've kind of started to think about that much more. And one of the things I also posted about was like how much time you actually have, which is a bit ironic because I'm speaking at an event now. But if you actually stop all the stuff like the networking and trying to like connect with investors and, you know, build a reputation and all that kind of stuff, you, you have a lot more time to actually just focus on building. Um, you know, things like co-working spaces, I love them, but I just, it's a lot of time it's not really productive. So... I've kind of changed my focus a little bit more um, and like started just thinking about um, the micro, like having um, living like a really good life day to day and not being 
you know, like caring about being startup known or anything like that. And I think that if you really focused on the right things, it's much better than like when I was kind of doing all the other stuff and it was like day to day was just so stressful. Um, and so next steps, um, we're actually like going to move to the country and um, not quite go the full tiny house pathway, but um, want to see how remote you can go. And I think it's kind of interesting in Australia because a lot of the population tends to be around cities and I'd love to see more people building companies, indie-based companies based from wherever they are and not being always about cities. And so finally, um, what I have started to do, so just to kind of summarise this um, the shift, but now I'm thinking about like indie labs or the indie way as more of an experimental labs and folding in different products and services into one company rather than having one company that has to be the be all and end all. And so there will be a bit of time for Q&A, but I just wanted to say, yeah, thank you. And that's the end for now. <laughs>